the world is in the middle of an awakening. Most of us who consider ourselves free thinkers or intelligent people, we're searching for something. Archaics isn't an institution where information is regurgitated. Archaics cites information from thousands of ancient texts and puts the pieces together that mainstream historians can never do. Archaics is different than any other channel out there simply because it's evidentiary based. Jason doesn't talk about anything he cannot back up with evidence. The deeper you delve into the Archaics material, the more this world we live in starts to make some sort of sense. My name is Jason, I'm the host of Archaics.com. I have spent 26 years of my life studying the oldest books in the world. I have the library to show it. What I have found is that the history that we have been taught in the last century isn't anything that comports with what is in the old books. I'm telling you, my friends, our world is not what you think. that was 2,760 years. I believe that was Hans Bellamy around 1901 or 1902 who wrote that, who published that, documented that. 2,760 years is highly specific. That's just the beginning. That's the first data point. The second data point. The Inca believed in a 2,070 year period. What? That is way too specific. Why add 70 years to 2,000? 2,000, 2000 is a nice round number. But they did. That's the second data point. Third data point. Aristarchus of Samos. Alexandrian Library. Very learned. Read, read, the, read historical books and historical monuments from, from hundreds, maybe even thousands of years before his time, and he did this 23 centuries ago. Aristarchus of Samos was convinced, and he published, that every 2,484 years, our world is destroyed. 2,484 years is very specific. Different languages, different continents, highly specific numbers. That's our third data point. Fourth data point. Well, a thousand years ago, Moses Maimonides, also called by his pseudonym Rashi, published that the world is destroyed. That in the period of 1656 years, the world is destroyed twice. Well, that's interesting because 1,656 years is highly specific. Those of you who know your Bibles also know that's the length of the pre-flood world. So Rashi was half correct, right? At the end of the 1656 year period, which in Genesis, the whole pre-flood world is 1,656 years, we have a world destruction called the Great Deluge, collapse of the vapor canopy, the day the sky fell. But Rashi said the beginning of that period was a destruction as well. But I've taken flack for that. A lot of people don't want to want to believe uh, uh, what I'm telling them. But Rashi's saying it right here, and that's exactly what we find in the Bible. There are, there are two schools of thought about the creation in Christian academia. Gap theory introduces a great cataclysm right after the creation. It causes vapor canopy, the firmament above, the waters below are divided from the waters above. Yeah, it's all there. But I've already discussed that in many videos. Adam and Eve is a reset story. So Rashi, Mo, Moses, Maimonides is absolutely correct. But that's our fourth data point, 1656 being very highly specific number. Nostradamus, Mikhail del Nostradam, said that, a, that there was a period before the flood that was important. He wrote this in a letter to King Henry IV. What was that period? It was 1,242 years. Again, fifth data point. Here's a number that's highly specific. Highly specific numbers are not random, my friends. You have some explaining to do, but let me go on to the sixth data point. The sixth data point in this challenge is that, as I've explained to you guys many times, 
We have chronographical material from the ancient world that specifically dates the Ogygian deluge as occurring in the year 2208. That's a highly specific dating. 2208 is said by many other authors to be exactly 1687 BC. This lines up perfectly with W.J. Perry's research, Children of the Sun. 551 pages of research showing that every dynasty in the ancient world collapsed in 1688 BC about. He was very, he was very adamant about saying his dating was not specific. He said it was circa 1688. 1688 is very specific though. But 2208 is our fifth data point. It's too specific. It's the dating of the Ogygian Deluge, which Harold T. Wilkins identifies as a Phoenix Phenomenon episode. Sixth data point. Can't ignore the sixth data point. That's our modern calendar. Anno Domini was started in 522 AD to hide an older calendar system called the Phoenix Cycle. And the Phoenix Cycle was 552 years. That's six data points, guys. That's six data points and the 552 year cycle you already know is exactly how many years it was from the Great Flood in 2239 BC to the Ogygian Deluge in 1687 BC. It was precisely 552 years. It's the old Phoenix cycle system, which was 552 years before Phoenix appeared again in 1135 BC and devastated the Mediterranean, which was 552 years again before 583 BC when the sun darkened and stopped the Medes and the Lydians in a, in a major battle and uh, was recorded on the monument of Yasilikaya in the days of Nebuchadnezzar II. Yeah, it was predicted by Thales of Miletus. Listen guys, can't make this stuff up. Six, six, six nicely packaged data points. These data points are all highly specific. Stephen Jones, Biblical Chronologist, studying the history of the world and analyzing Biblical Chronology, the Book of Jasher, Book of Enoch, and the Assyrian Epidemics. That man found a 414 year timeline embedded all throughout history where terrible things happened. He called it the Cursed Earth Period. 414 years is very specific. Now, I've revealed other ones, but this is sufficient for my data set. That's seven. Seven data points right there. Here's, here's the eighth data point. The eighth data point is every single number that I just told you that's highly specific. Let's do a recap. 2760 of the Maya. 2070 of the Inca. 2484 of Aristarchus of Samos. 1242 of Nostradamus. 22, 2208 of Marcus Varro and, and uh, Arch, Archbishop James Usher of Augustine of Hippo. I already said 1242, so 2208. Uh, 552 of the Phoenix Cycle. 414, Cursed Earth Period. All highly specific. So the very, so the eighth data point here is the fact that every single number is divisible by 138. We're not done with our data set though. Because we can add another data point. And that data point is really interesting. That data point is that there are old Jewish traditions that the angel of death visits destruction every 138 years. Angels get kicked out of heaven and they have to stay banished for 138 years because they reveal, they reveal to uh, Lot that Sodom and Gomorrah were going to be destroyed. And they were punished for that. They weren't supposed to tell no anybody. This 138 years then, we can ignore the fact that the Great Pyramid is patterned in, in dimensions of 138 as I've shown. We can ignore all these. We can even ignore the entire 138 year history of the Phoenix. Now, 3895 BC, 2653 BC, 2239 BC, 1825 BC, 1687 BC, 1549 BC. The Phoenix was documented in all these years. 1411 BC. Yeah, guys. 1135 BC. Sure was. 583 BC, 445 BC, 307 BC. Uh, Han Dynasty, 169 BC. 31 BC, the ancient Americas are destroyed, Olmec civilization collapsed, 
fiery red dragon appears over overall Egypt Egypt during the Battle of Actium major earthquakes level Olympia and Greece and and it's one of the worst series of earthquakes ever recorded in Judea 31 BC was terrible Hell yeah 246 AD 378 AD 522 AD begins the Dark Ages, the creation of the Anno Domini calendar to hide the Phoenix calendar. That's why the papacy did it. We can ignore the entire Phoenix chronology, guys. Ignore it all. Just using this one data set. For those of you that have taken the Phoenix data seriously, as you should, our reaction should not be so serious. Let me explain. I have said over and over in my videos that the Phoenix phenomenon is discriminating. It's not, it's not what you think. Initially, my research showed some very harrowing material. These great destructions, periodic, these 138 year resets. But the more I analyze the data, the more I see that this phenomenon is very, very discriminating. This is how this should translate to you. When we research all the Phoenix data concerning the pre-flood world and the vapor canopy world, the collapse of the vapor canopy that caused what we know of as the Great Flood, which was not a worldwide flood, a flood event where everything died, but it was worldwide flooding, there is a distinction to be made here. Now, the Phoenix event was predicted. In fact, in the narrative that's been passed down to us, Noah was specifically warned that in exactly 128 years, this, this devastation was going to occur. He was given a warning, but he's not the only one. In these gene genealogical narratives that we've been given, and I've already explained in the Anuda Files, Noah's pedigree and how his appearance and the appearance of other Caucasians basically shocked the old world because white people were not a part of the pre-flood chronologies the histories the traditions and lore the legends the myths everything that is passed down to us from the pre-flood world is basically these great this great shock was to a non-caucasian world that had its first contact with white people but noah was of this lineage He was one, one of the people who had, his pedigree was among those who had forged the Heliolithic empires after the collapse of the vapor canopy. When the vapor canopy collapsed, the ancients all recorded that the sun was born, and to them the sun was born. At the same time, that Aryan Caucasian type peoples weren't really concentrating on the sun, they were concentrating on a very, interesting visual effect of the absence of the vapor canopy and that was the rainbow suddenly rainbows appeared and that in, the appearance of the rainbow entered into the historical narrative as a promise from the godhead the creator the oversoul that he would never again flood the earth and of course how could he flood the earth common sense common sense back then dictated that it wasn't even possible anymore because there was no vapor canopy it was gone there was a definitive knowledge of the coming of the phoenix each time it came in the ancient world at least in the oldest records we don't have a lot i mean phoenix destructions were pre pretty they were pretty total in some parts of the world to where we don't have any records left whatsoever. But that doesn't mean the Phoenix destroyed them. Christian rulers have a really bad track record of destroying entire libraries. Noah, Noah knew of the coming of the Phoenix. Noah's civilization was preserved. They knew and they prepared. But they didn't go underground. They built ships. They spread out, they spread out among islands, they spread out all over the place to, make, to ensure that there would be some type of survival. He's not the only one, but the thread becomes very interesting because the next historical, the next time that we have 
that the Phoenix appeared that was a great, terrible destruction was 1687 BC. It's known as the Ogygian Deluge, uh, the Ogygian Flood. Uh, it's like an apocalypse for the Mediterranean, but it was predicted by Jacob. Jacob knew. Jacob and his sons, the Israelites, they were fighting the Canaanites after their sister Dinah had been raped by the men of Shisham. They were sorely outnumbered, yet they planned the attack and they, they timed the attack. And as, as the Israelites were about to attack the Canaanites who outnumbered them 10 to 1, all of a sudden the sun darkened. The sky went black. An earthquake shook the foundations of the entire world. Stones fell from the sky and smoked the Canaanites. And a great fear and consternation seized them to where they did not want to mess with the Israelites. That was in 1687 BC. It wasn't dated by me. But even more so, they, Jacob and the Israelites were direct descendants of Noah in the narrative that's been passed down to us. And they had a knowledge of the Phoenix chronology. That is very interesting. We have mad, we have huge mass migrations of the Danan. This is in the Old Testament where the tribe of Dan took to ships and they got the hell out of there early on. And in the historical record, we have the Danan appearing all over Argos and Mycenae, Joppa, the, the ancient cities that later became known as Greece. We have these huge fleets of Dan, uh, 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 people called the Danan that appeared. And the Danan is nothing but an Achaean, and it, it's, a, it's an Achaean description of people of Dan. Now, the descendant, the descendants of, of, of the Mycenaeans who were of Danan stock, and the Danan had come from the tribe of Dan, the tribe of Dan had left the ancient Israelite occupation almost as soon as they had conquered the, Can the seven nations of Canaan and took their land and occupied it after they themselves had escaped ancient Egypt. The Danan were goddess worshippers. This is why when they appeared in ancient Ireland, Tuatha de Danan mean, pe means people of the goddess Danu. You have to understand, as Israelite descended peoples, they were, they were worshippers of, of Hathor. They worshipped the Egyptian goddess who was represented by the image of Hathor, a cow. Remember, the Israelites in the Old Testament worshipped the golden calf. This was goddess worship. However, these patriarchal peoples, when they had, when they had left Egypt, they had adopted the older patriarchal systems of the Amorites whom they were descended from. Remember, there is an obscure reference in the Old Testament. It's only mentioned one time, but it is it is thoroughly, thoroughly ignored by many by many people. And that that obscure statement, anybody can use Strong's Concordance, anybody can Google this. But that obscure statement refers to the ancient Israelites being descended from the Amorites. Man, this really troubles a lot of people, man, because they have bought into the Jewish redactionism about the, how evil the Amorites were. The Jews couldn't stand the ancient Israelites who were Amorites. Abraham was an Amorite. This is in the Old Testament. 1687 B.C., Jews have re rewritten all these records, but they have, they have preserved a, an element about Jacob and the Israelites predicting, uh, choosing the time to battle and all that. Uh, the Phoenix appears and, all, and it's in the book of Jasher. It's dated by Stephen Jones in Biblical in uh, Secrets of Time, and I mentioned it many times. Now the descendants of Atreus, Atreus himself having predicted the darkening of the sun by Phoenix, the descendants 138 years later were the Danan who, who landed on the shores of ancient Ireland. But ancient Ireland was occupied by a race of gigantic people called the Furbolgs. The Furbolgs were kin to other giants that were living in Albion, which you know of as Britain called called the Fomori, the Fomorians. It was acknowledged by ancient writers that both the Furbolds and the Fomori, these giant races that occupied the British Isles, were actually from the Mediterranean area. And in the Mediterranean, we already know that the chief giants that existed then were the Anakim. And the Anakim come from According to the old the old Ionian records, which were preserved by Robert Graves in the Greek myths in his epic work called The White Goddess, the Anakim derived from the Greek historical Anax, A-N-A-X. But Anax 
and this is where they, it was such a it was a name that was so so uh, uh, prestigious that and 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 Axodrides, Anaximander, these 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 uh, uh, Greek naturalists and later scholars and philosophers took their name from from this because Anax was like a king. But uh, in the Bible, they're the Anakim. We find out in the Book of Numbers that one of one of the three major sons, the head of a whole entire tribe of Anak, who was described as a gigantic person was named Tamahu. He gave his name, his name is Talmai. In the Amuru dialect, his name becomes Tamahu. Other historians have been, they have been really surprised to find on the walls of the Egyptian temple of Karnak, actual racial depictions of a people called the Tamahu. And they are far taller than anybody else found anywhere in racial portraits throughout Egypt. They're giants. So the Old Testament record about these people is absolutely correct. Now, to find descendants of these people in ancient Ireland was really well, it was a shock to the Danan, who had thought they had left those, left those giant races behind. If you wonder, if you remember the story in the Old Testament, the chief reason why Dan took to ships in Phoenicia and Aram and built fleets and left was because their lot in the land of promise, when the ancient Canaan was divided into twelve. Uh, 12 portions, their lot was the Valley of Rephaim. The Valley of Rephaim means Valley of the Giants. Rephaim comes from, from an old root, mean, meaning unresurrected ones, or those who cannot resurrect, or walking dead. Now, it comes from the, the old Semitic root Rapha, the dead that are alive. So, I'm telling you all this because the story, the, the history of the Phoenix was preserved only through Israelite descended peoples. When the when the Tuatha Dé Danann, who still who were still worshiping Hathor the the cow goddess uh, of ancient Egypt, arrived in ancient Ireland and fought, they they got they got their asses handed to them by the by the fur bones, which is exactly what they were leaving behind in Canaan. They didn't want to fight giants. They didn't want to fight giants, but here they are fighting giants now, and it just happened. So, so whatever, you, you can call it God, divine providence, whatever. The problem they left behind became the problem that was before them. In the Irish Book of the Four Masters, in the Annals of Clonmac Noise, we have actual records of these wars. In the second battle of Moitura, which is called the Field of Towers, which opens up an entirely new mystery about the ancient towers of Ireland. Very profound towers. They were, their, their reason for existence isn't anything we've been told, because they don't hold anything. Most of the time, people can't even fit in them, but they're, but they're masterwork architecture. In the Second Battle of Machora, Machora, uh, it was the Field of Towers, Second Battle of the Field of Towers. The Danan, the Danan timed the the battle. As soon as their as soon as their army had amassed and challenged the Firbolgs, the Firbolgs watched as the sun darkened, but the Danan, the two at the day Danan did not panic. The sky turned black. There were earthquakes, things fell from the sky, but the Danan attacked. They used the Phoenix Phenomenon to their advantage. There are many references to the Phoenix Phenomenon being the, in the Bible, being referred to as the Angel of Death. This, this ties in to your observation, to your question about what do we do about the, the Phoenix Phenomenon, man? What do we, how do we prepare and all that? Listen. The Phoenix Phenomenon is far more sophisticated and discriminating than I have led you to believe. It is not a natural phenomenon. Do you remember the story in the book of Exodus where the Israelites painted lamb's blood over their doors and anyone with lamb's blood over their doors, do you remember what happened? When the angel of death appeared in the sky and the sky went dark for, and the ten plagues occurred, what happened? I'm going to tell you what happened. When, they, when, when the Egyptians were being slaughtered in the streets by, by supernatural phenomena, when things were going, running around Egypt and killing indiscriminately, the angel of death left the Israelites alone.
And that's exactly what's going to happen in 2040. The book of Revelation is very clear about the apocalypse go is going to be affected against the rulers of this world and those who follow them. But it's also very clear that one-fourth of the entire world's population will die. But you have to understand that when we're talking about when we're talking about a quarter of the world's population will die. Do you have any idea how many people die every single typhoon? Every every time a typhoon appears in Bangladesh, those people don't bat an eye at 230,000 people dying. China, the floods in China killing people, they never accurately report the death tolls. Never. In just in just the belt, the belt from India and Pakistan stretching across South Southeast Asia to China and Mongolia is almost 70% of the entire world's population. I do not believe the Phoenix phenomenon is going to affect much of the Israelite descended peoples or the civilization, civilizations they host. This means that per, that type of protection, that discriminating power of whatever the Phoenix phenomenon is, is basically going to preserve the Western world. I know it sounds weird, but I'm also tying, I'm also, I'm also cognizant of very specific prophecies of Nostradamus and where the areas that are affected are going to be. Several large cities of the Western world will sink. Will they will be destroyed? But I'm not sure about losses of population among Western peoples. I'm just not sure. I don't see it. Not even Nostradamus talks about that. He talks about mass migrations. Nostradamus is very specific about about the 2040 through 2046 period. He describes not a mass death. He describes massive migrations because certain areas of the world have now become uninhabitable. And this is a repeat of what occurred in the ancient world when there were fleets, massive amounts of people leaving North, Central, and South America and going to the Old World. So in that story of the Exodus, we have, we have the information that's presented to us that the reason the ancient Israelites were preserved was because they had put this blood over, the, over their doors, this lamb's blood. I don't believe that's, I don't believe that actually happened. I believe that that was later invented. It was late, it's a later invention to explain why the Israelites had been pre, had been preserved. These Amorite Hurrians that were occupying the Goshen area of ancient Egypt, where the Great Pyramid was. The Colburn Bible describes the Exodus event in detail. It talks about uh, what really happened. It gives very, very interesting details from a non-Jewish rabbinical redactionist perspective. It's very interesting. This is why I value the Colvin Bible, because we have something closer to the truth than we do the biblical version, which was designed to control how you thought events uh, unfolded. The blood over the the blood over the door was 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 added by later writers to describe how it was possible that Israelites survived a cataclysm that Egyptians did not. So, my point here. Oh, for those of you who want to read a more historically accurate version of what had the cataclysm in ancient Egypt where the doom shape appeared, which is which was the Phoenix phenomenon, which is in the Old Testament the angel of death, which chooses who dies and who doesn't. Listen, we're all, it's a it's it's really it's really been eye opening to me as I go over my since I opened my office, since I unpacked all my research and I now have it accessible to me, I can go through my, my Phoenix notes and I see all these notes that I've taken over the years that I had totally forgotten that I had written down. But anything, I don't know what inspires, inspires me to write down certain facts that they're tangential or they have absolute no, they're so disconnected from anything that I was researching. I don't know why I wrote those notes down. But in retrospect now, I, I, I see it. It's all very clear to me.
Now concerning the doom shape, the phoenix and its, its discriminating nature, this is what I believe is going to occur in the year 2040 in the month of May. I believe that the elect, the called, the chosen, the faithful, the meek of the earth, those, those who are consider themselves enlightened, I do believe that the phoenix is going to, you're going, it's the Passover. It's a human Passover. You have nothing to fear. You worry about the phoenix. Listen, I have to present the material as I discover it. Yes, the phoenix is harrowing, but it's a matter of perspective. We live in the simulacrum. This is how this phenomenon can be discriminating. Because if we lived in a true Newtonian universe, what I am describing would be a total, absolute anomaly. There's no way it could, it, it could happen. There's no way even an alien extraterrestrial technology could fill the sky and pick and choose who it's going, who, who's going to live and who's going to die. There's no way it would be possible. But if everything is coded and simulated, then every bit of what I am describing is absolutely possible. Remember, I do tell y'all that, that the mystery of history is coding. Everything is simulated. And if any one thing is simulated or can be shown to be simulated, then my friends, everything is simulated. And this includes the discriminatory nature of the Phoenix phenomenon. All throughout history, when it chose who would survive and who would go. It, this was, these were these were not random events at by far. In answer to your question, I don't believe you have anything to fear. You don't need to bug out. You don't need to find some place out in the country where you're going to survive. You don't need to do all these, man, because this is fear-based. <coughs> your internal coding responds to you because you're a spiritual being. But the coding is a part of, of, a, of a materialist mindset. You... If you're going to fear something, then you're going to create an interference pattern. An inter interference pattern is how you create new patterns in your life. If they're fear-based, then the simulacrum is going to, going to respond in kind. It's going to honor your wishes. If you wish, if you're fearing that something's going to happen, then the simulacrum does not want you to be a liar. It's going to make what you fear happen. And this is, the, this is the loop that we are stuck in on a daily basis. We do this to ourselves all the time. How do we escape the simulacrum? And I have, to, I, have to, I have to return such an inquiry with a question of my own. Because I'm genuinely curious. What makes you believe that we need to escape the simulacrum? I believe that I'm an immortal, I'm an immortal being, and I was put through this experience for a reason. I also believe that there is nothing that I do in this life that actually carries carries with it with it any negative eternal consequences. I believe that's why this world was made. It was to figure things out. It was to solve problems, but it was also for the very obvious to me development of the immortal soul, the personality. Only by experiencing multiple timelines multiple multiple histories multiple personalities only by me being a female and a male in different times of my life me being black me being hispanic me being australian me being well all the different all the different races cultures and personalities that i have been through multiple lifetimes have i been able to mature to the eternal being that i am right now experiencing the same simulacrum but a different timeline all of this makes sense. I don't believe there is a reason to escape, nor do I want to. And my own conclusions are derived from, from this immense amount of data that I have poured over, trying to make sense and call it. We pick up all these independent pieces of data and we, and we build pictures. That's what a historian, that's what a prophet does. He builds pieces from the independent piece independent fragments that have been passed down to us in intuition our guide it's very difficult to go wrong I don't think we need to escape the smilacrum I don't believe we can further further 
I believe it, I believe it's an impediment to our further growth to one fear anything that's coming in the future and two try to afford it in any way I know many of my listeners are prepared common sense dictates that we, we prepare for the future and to a certain degree I I sure it's then I agree but I don't we need to prepare for basic things basic things that help us live our life and all that I don't believe it's necessary for you to spend your life with in, 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 by, in fear default and, and spend all your, your finances and resources on ramen noodle soups and MREs and ammunition and all this. And you know what? It's good to be prepared to an extent, but I think you can go overboard. What do we do to override the similar, this negativity? You said that in Facebook. So here's a, here's a third aspect. Let me tell you something. It has long been known before I was born. Act as if you are, and you will be. Man, when we act and assert ourselves upon reality with absolute confidence, reality around us reciprocates, and the conditions of our lives suddenly shift to comport with this way that we see ourselves. Or this 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 persona that we emanate and we give off that is accepted by people around us, this fearlessness, it's absorbed into our environment, and our environment our environment responds, and it creates situations by which others see us as fearless, and dauntless, and even supernatural. I just don't I don't think we're meant to escape the similar from I think we're meant to experience it and draw from it what we can. Because the similar from puts us into situations by which we are put into the very, the very situations that make us draw more from us than we actually contain. This secret about humanity means specifically that we are drawing power and energy from something beyond ourselves. I do this frequently and don't even, and I take it for granted now, I do it so often. It's not simply adrenaline. When a woman sees a, a car run over her baby and she goes over there without thinking and lifts that car off of her infant. That's not adrenaline. That was pure rewriting of coding. The very coding that gives us this persuasion of a Newtonian world. If you're learning about the Phoenix Phenomenon, I assure you, you are meant to survive it. Do not fear. If you're learning this information, there is a reason why the simulacrum puts you in the vantage point of receiving it. There's a reason why you and I met. What in the hell is going on underground? Well, I'm going to tell you what's going on underground. We already have underground facilities. We have military installations. We have all kinds of things. But one thing that we do not have right now, until recently, is a working knowledge of the chronology of when this cataclysm is going to take place. If you think that the elite do not have think tanks in the NSA, CIA, and all these alphabet groups don't have their feelers out for all maverick researchers and scholars who come up with all this deal and they don't and they don't fact check their material to see which theories hold water and which ones don't, you're sorely mistaken. A lot of our taxpayer money goes into secret black budget programs where people like me, Jason Brashears, are being researched quietly by government operatives who are documenting all my data. And they're fact checking it. And with the archaics research, they're probably very well attuned to what I have been publishing since the year 2003. Don't forget, people. I've showed you in the Archaics Facebook group, Matthew Devereaux has posted it, actual article published in Nature Magazine, one of the most prestigious peer-reviewed magazine in Scientifico. And they critiqued one of my theories in that, in, that, in that magazine. Who am I? I was in prison when they did that. And yes, they talked bad about my 2046 date. 
and they said it was bullshit and nothing, nothing. But you know what? Back in 2003, I had a workable chronology, but I didn't have all the data I have today. But the very fact remains is, is someone thought I was important enough in 2003 to be attacked. A prisoner in a prison cell coming up with a theory and someone took my theory and I drew it in chart form and they released it on the internet and they made a bunch of copies and sent it as an email campaign in 2003 and in 2004 it was in Nature Magazine. I've already posted the article, actual pictures of it and what they said. The reason I'm mentioning that is not because I have some hyperinflated ego but to let you know that my theories have already gained attention. You have to understand Somebody has actively spent money on a campaign to denigrate me on Amazon. I have some terrible reviews. Now people in Archaics and on YouTube who have actually ordered or read my books have nothing to say but praise. Because the Archaics research, I chase my source materials. I don't just cite something because I found it in a book. I order the books I find that are mentioned in books. I make sure they say what they said they said. I am, I am an impeccable researcher. Dot my eyes and I cross my T's. Because if I'm ever put into the position where somebody's going to accept one of my challenges for a debate, believe me, they're going to walk away changed. They may hate me, but that's okay. But I refuse to, I refuse to walk through this life claiming, making the claims that I make without being able to defend them to anybody who wants to stand before me. I have no problem with, with debate or contention. I have no problem embarrassing people either. Especially those who, who believe they know really haven't done the research. All the data is there. There's nothing theoretical about, about mathematics. It's all causal. But what's happening underground is not taking out satanic facilities to rescue children. That's all bullshit. It's all cover story. These detonations that are being recorded on YouTube by many, by many YouTubers because they have the because they're putting out basically the same signatures and they're at the same depth is because somebody is taking me seriously and not just me but others who put out information like me I don't know who they are but I'm pretty sure they're out there they're getting ready for May, May 2040 now because of some of the data that I have divulged that I have discovered in Rosicrucian texts and beliefs and the Masonic Order of the 33rd degree, I even put that in a video, I am 100, because it is a phoenix, I do believe that the elite have been in possession of much of the data that I have, that I have I've discovered and found. And this is why so many, so, so much of that data has basically, it's, it's opposed in the, in the, in academia. Such, a, such as there's been a tremendous amount of money spent trying to convince the public that Thales of Miletus in 585 BC merely predict, he's the first person to predict an eclipse. But eclipses were being predicted centuries before Thales. And Thales was very, very adamant that it was not the moon that was darkening the sun. Everybody knew what eclipses were 500 years before Christ. That's ridiculous. But that's what they want you to believe because they don't want you to understand the alternative. See, the alternative is what Charles Ford has, has documented so many times. That something, not a member of our ordinary solar system and not the moon, passes over the surface of the sun and darkens the entire world for a two to three hour period. Whatever that something is, it's gigantic. So, needless to say, Trolls come from the underworld, so do the, so do the elves, they come from Niflheim, land of the fallen ones. They're, our underworld is ancient. David Hatcher Childress has done a fantastic job amassing over 20 different old books from early explorers in Peru and Bolivia and shows sophisticated, technolithic, amazingly precise underground tunnels. The reason they were found and you, they could be entered is because in 1687 BC, the entire continent of South America, Peru and Bolivia, was suffered a, a upheaval. So these are these underground bases, uh, they're being prepared. Underground, underground facilities are being prepared basically to house many of the human race. I don't know who's making them. Might be good, might be good guys, might be bad guys. Good guys might be taken out 
the the uh the, the underground bases now people want to call them domes deep underground military bases i don't like the term i like the more ancient i like the more ancient term of arcs the reason i like arcs is because we we have basically been brainwashed into into believing that the concept of arc was only a ship or a boat that contained everything like animals and survivors and foodstuffs provisions supplies but it's not remember the israelites used to carry an ark that ark gave the whole nation sustenance it gave them protection it gave them guidance it gave them all these things it also housed very important items like manna which was supposed to be angel food the rod of aaron which was supposed to be have magic and medicinal properties the tablets of the law which was supposed to be the guiding principles of, of civilization or uh, right and wrong now these concepts were abbreviated into the form of a, arc, a, a magical box that that men carried uh priests carried but the earliest concepts of arc of, a, of an arc was a container that contained everything that was needed and preserved through a disaster or a time of need. An underground facility can be an arc. It can have grain silos. It can have manufacturing. It can have multiple levels. You can manufacture and build vehicles and trucks and even aircraft in some of these facilities. These facilities are arcs. In the ancient world, they had them. In 1962, an underground an underground city, the I don't even want to try to pronounce it. Do you? Do you? I don't even know. I don't even care. I'm not Turkish. So it was so ancient that even 3,500 years ago, the Hittite civilization, they explored these underground cities and they only got to the third level underground. Now we know they're 10 and 12 levels levels deep. They have been thoroughly they have been thoroughly uh, uh, explored. They have underground tunnel systems that lead to each one. 61 of these underground cities have been found in Turkey, and you can fact check that. You can you can Google the underground cities of Turkey, and you will find that there's really not no not much known about them, other than, other than the fact that they could have housed close to 250,000 people. That's amazing. What were they hiding from? The aqueducts, the canals, and the and the air shafts are so sophisticated that the surface could have flooded with water, and the and people still would have had breathable air under. It's fascinating. 61 of these underground cities have been found. David Hatcher Childress and many other researchers have found the ones in South America, and the only reason they found them is because South America suffered upheaval of 14,000 feet altitude. This is why Pumapuka, Titicaca, Tiwanaku, uh, Cuzco, this is why all these ancient Peruvian cities made of megalithic, technolithic architecture are found at 12,000 feet. Machu Picchu, they're found at 12,000 feet, but archeologists today just to explore them have to have to wear a breathing apparatus. They weren't built at 12,000 feet. We know that for a fact because many of these ancient Peruvian cities have, have fossilized coastlines around them. Whoever, whoever is visiting our world, they're not coming from space and they're not coming from the stars. They are contained inside this holography with us. They have long lived in our underworld. And now, whether they like it or not, we are doing something about it. Because now we know that the Phoenix phenomenon is gonna occur, followed by Nemesis X object and, and all the stuff in the book of Revelation. Now, this taps into many other prophecies like Nostradamus, Mother Shipton, Earthless South Hill, and the book of Revelation, which also speak about humans will flee to the mountains and underground caves. Mother Shipton's prophecies are fantastic because they're five centuries ago and she didn't have the frames of reference for the things that she was talking about. But she specifically mentions that after the apocalypse period, humans technologically advanced will emerge from their underground bases and start civilization over again. And they will be teachers and guides and providers for those who have survived on the surface and lost everything. The underworld is full of people. It always has been. And they've been accused of being elves and dwarves and 
They've been accused of all kinds of things, but they were just trying to survive. And many times they came to the surface and very cleverly used their technologies to put whole families and communities into a deep slumber so they could switch out the infants with their own. These infants were always accused of being fairy babies, but the villagers wouldn't throw them away. They went ahead and raised them. Well, when they grew up, those fairy babies were Caucasians. And the dark-skinned, smooth-skinned, beardless villagers were always amazed. It's like, wow, how'd this happen? The history of our world is fascinating. And I tell you guys all the time, our world is not what you think. But we have had a thriving Homo Anunus civilization beneath us for thousands of years. As civilizations rose and fell, they've always been there. They've always tried to communicate with us. They've always tried to guide us. There may be factions that are enemies and there could be wars going on beneath us that we don't know about. But right now, the military industrial complex around the world that is allied to each other, but merely just plays politics facially, they're preparing. They're carving out caverns and tunnels and building down there. Those are those are demolition detonations. They're getting ready because it's coming. Because the archaics research is widely known. It's been fact checked. Don't think the government and the elite haven't been, haven't been listening to a lot of a lot of YouTubers and people on Facebook and social media that know what they're talking about because they do. They can put it together better than we can. I would not doubt if there are scientists in the world today that not only have taken all of my data but have gone far farther with it than I, would, I could ever imagine and will probably never share any of it with me I have no doubt so the ancient world is one that perplexes many people and it's because the the renditions that have been passed on down to us are just not they're not accurate they don't comport with what we find in archaeology in geology they, they don't there's nothing there's nothing in the historical record as put out by the establishment that has any relation to the truth it's basically pure fantasy so we have a situation in the ancient world we're gonna go back to about 4,000 years ago about three centuries after an event known and recorded in many historical books as the Great Flood now mind you when I say the Great Flood Many people are offended because they automatically believe that, that mentioning the Great Flood is in some way evidence or I'm putting out, I'm putting out the information that, well, that, that means the Bible is true, the Old Testament is true. While, while the Old Testament does have many historical events that were recorded contemporaneous with other, other civilizations, the Great Flood in itself was not a, a total world-destroying event. Many civilizations continued unabated. Now. But we have a very unique phenomenon with several civilizations in the old Bronze Age period that were working on major construction projects, earthquake proofing their cities, walls, fortifications, their entire infrastructures were being laid out in the most unusual building materials. In the ancient world we find whole entire cities made of basalt and diorite. The, the diorite, rhyolite, diorite, basalt, these are the heaviest. They are, they are compounds packed full of very heavy quartz crystals. The, but they have a common denominator. These building materials, being crystalline in nature and the heaviest, also resonate with the highest frequencies. We have in the archaeological record evidence, massive mining sites all over the world, construction sites. There was a building program going on in 1687 BC such as this world has never seen before. We have found the evidence in the middle of the Pacific at the island of Yap in the ancient basalt city of Metallinan. We have found the evidence in Michigan, Ohio, ancient mines, copper mines, strip mines, Thousands of hammers, tools, and chisels left where they were. Workbenches left where they were. No one was found because they ran away. Something interrupted a massive building project at Tiwanaku, at Lucramata, at Cusco, all throughout the cities of Peru. 
at Tiryns in Greece, in Egypt, many civilizations were interrupted by something that they totally did not expect. However, it was an event for which they were preparing for, and that's the subject of this video. How could Caucasian, Indo-American, Indian, Dravidic, Egyptian, we're talking about Comitian and, and uh, post-Kemet Egypt, how can so many different civilizations from Akkad and Sumer, Elam, Ugarit, Urartu, uh, Syrophoenicia, the Harappan civilization, and there are there are many that I can't even name because uh, Oriental scholars are only now excavating these ruins all throughout Thailand and Tibet. Pre-Chinese, older than the Chinese dynasties, these ruins, and there's hammers and chisels and and all their building apparatus was left worldwide everyone was building cities and fortifications and they were strengthening their infrastructures knowing that a cataclysm was coming how could have every single civilization been deceived into thinking that the awaited for cataclysm was going to come at a much later time this is the subject of this video what we have uncovered is astonishing. But over and over and over, we find in the calendrical records of the Hindus, the Dravidians, in ancient Aryan Sanskrit texts, we find in the Chinese Dragon King annals, we find in the bamboo books, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Nag Hammadi Library, even in the Old Testament records, there are references over and over and over to a 600 year period, a yuga. It was a actual period of time, 216,000 days that was known to the ancients and it was widely venerated. In fact, in later, ba in later Babylonia, the ancient Anuna had become the Anunnaki and they had been demonized by the priesthoods of, the ba of Babylonia. But the number 600 has been found over and over and over in reference to these Babylonian texts. The Anunnaki were always referenced as the Nur. Nur, in the ancient Near, Near Eastern uh, ideograms, was the number 600. There are several invocation texts that have been found by Sumerologists and translated, and they are baffling because they are prayers to the Anunnaki calling them the Holy 600 and how they had wrought destruction on, 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 on uh, mankind, on mankind's cities. and it's, it's really astonishing. But we have uh, J.D. Parsons in the 1800s who did extensive research on Near Eastern studies of traditions, world worldwide cataclysms, and he came to the conclusion that there was a belief system in the old Bronze Age that pretty much that pretty much held that the entire world, old world, was structured on a calendar where major events happened every six hundred years exactly. Enter in the records of the Old Testament. When we review the chronology of the Old Testament, we find some pretty peculiar things, such as we find out about the Nephilim and the giants, and and we, we learn we learn we learn that the sons of God came down and they copulated with the daughters of men, and they begat giants and all that. But in the Haggadoth text and in the rabbinical literature, in the Book of Jasher and the Books of Enoch, we're giving a date. We are told in the genealogies exactly when Enoch was born and when his father was born and when and when Enoch died. And we are told that the year that the watchers descended among men and exchanged technologies for human women was the was the year that comports to our calendar as 3439 BC. And it doesn't matter it, it doesn't even matter if if we even go with 34, 39 BC, we can just go with the, the old year that's in the rabbinical literature of 456. We'll just go with the Annus Mundi year 456, which is supposed to be the original Hebrew calendar of 456. In the 456th year, according to the Enochian and Jasher and rabbinical Haggadoth records, we have the descent of something, a race of people, 
they came to earth they began they began exchanging the knowledge techn- all kinds of technical information to neolithic people who needed it and they gave them their fairest daughters in exchange for this information this exchange of information led to the birth of an entire race the story is very well detailed in the rabbinical literature in the Haggadoth, in the zoroastrian literature especially in uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Lamech Scroll, uh, maybe even the Abraham Scroll, maybe, maybe the, the Apocrypha of Abraham, I believe there's a reference to it, of this 600 year period from the descent of these people and the exchange of these informations, it took 600 years to the year 1056 when something unusual happened. Something so unusual that most historical books have either eliminated it, scrubbed it out, or those books themselves have vanished and disappeared. No one wants to talk about what the Dead Sea Scrolls is describing, and what these Zoroastrian records are describing, and what the Haggadoth records are talking about. We have matriarchal societies of, of raven, dark, straight-haired people with black eyes, smooth, hairless skin, basically, you're, you're Asiatic. All over the world, in the Urumbaba Valley, in South America, Central America, in the Harappan Valley civilization of India, in the uh, Tigris Euphrates, the Babylonian Sumerian Akkadian culture later, in Elam, in the Harappan Valley, later, later to become uh, uh, Mohenjo-Daro and, and several other cities in, in India, Pakistan. The Yangtze Valley of China, the, Ye- the Yellow River. He said, these are all basically the same people and they describe the same thing. Suddenly, children were born that were not like them. They had bright colored eyes, green, like emeralds, blue, they had light colored hair. Their skin was like snow or porcelain. They were, con- they were considered to be genies, jinn, the child of devils, the child of angels, the sons of gods. They were considered to be all, all they, they had to be the progeny of the visitors because they were so unlike them. But it was ordinary women of Asiatic descent that were having these children. And it shocked them. And the story, in, in, in the story as transla- as has been transmitted to us over the years from the Lamech scroll describes Lamech going into a panic, thinking his wife had had adulterous relations with one of the Watchers, one of the sons, because he basically perfectly described a Caucasian baby in his cradle. And this is what we find in traditions all around the world: a race was suddenly born into this world from the meeting of two two races. Now, later on, we are told that one race came from the stars. I highly contend that. I believe we live in a biosphere. I don't believe a single rocket or space shuttle or satellite has ever left this containment field. Every, every bit of that is deceit. It's totally intended to get you to believe that we live in a vast cosmos when we don't. While the containment field that we are in, like a Dyson shell, may exist within a vast cosmos, what we're inside does not. That holography you see in the sky is just that. It's a very clever clever hologram. But what we have is a 600 year period where somebody came down from some mountains. Later on in the, in the Babylonian records, they came from the stars, but they, that's not the earliest. The earliest records is they arrived in a fleet of ships. The very oldest Sumerian records concern strange visitors coming by ship. And it might have been a starry night, but they came in fleets from Dillman. And Dillman was just a way station from which they had come from much further. And in my own research, I show that much further was North America, where their entire infrastructure had been buried in a Phoenix cataclysm, where the ground had vibrated and the air had vibrated to such a high resonance that everything material sank about 60 feet and when the when the noise like a trumpet stopped everything hardened because once dissonance once dissonance is created out of resonant resonance 
what you have is a return to the a return to normal. At, when solid objects are vibrating at super high frequencies, they can actually pass through each other. This is why people and animals and architecture can sink 40, 50, 60, and 70 feet into the ground if the if the if the sound is vibrating and the resonance goes that deep into the topography. Well, what we have is a 600 year period and it was very important to the ancients because to them it was a 600 year period that marked the appearance of benefactors people who brought civilization people who brought ships and marketing and farming and planting they brought everything the neolithic hunter gatherers did not possess later on they became gods and all that but the original story was a race of people of very fair features showing up on the shores in five different river valleys around the world and basically taking over but peacefully by the exchange by trade setting up trade alliances is what they did now exactly why they wanted daughters maybe they wanted to intermarry they wanted to strengthen their own numbers uh, and couldn't do so because it, they were mostly males that too is that too is supported in the historical record we do have many traditions from the mediterranean world that concern a ship appearing at the dawn of a nation's uh beginning and that ship always contained 50 males and one and they were led by a hero and the personalities of those males had developed over time into a mythos uh, such as jason and the 50 are argonauts and there jason's not the only one there are many other uh traditions involving a ship appearing with 50 men on board at the beginning of a country's uh, inception. So this 600 year period wasn't the, wasn't the first. It was confirmed in the ancient mindset by a second event which also happened exactly 216,000 days later in the month of May on May 15th in the year 2239, which was in their calendar, the year 1656. The year 1656 is the Hebrew year, rabbinical year, for the Great Flood. This was 1,200 years from the descent of the gods from the mountains or the oceans or wherever they had come from, which leads into our, our next chronological mystery. The Kali Yuga the yugas of the ancient Sanskrit writings, the Mayan texts, the Olmec calendar. We have references over and over and over to ages in triplicate or ages in the singular all being 432,000 days. This is my chief argument against Sitchin's chronology. Zechariah Sitchin was a man of genius for having put together everything he did, but he's also a man. He committed errors just like I have committed errors. Now, I don't know why Sitchin promoted the theory he did when Eupolemus and many other ancient writers all corrected this problem. The day count system was known in antiquity. They did not recognize years because they lived beneath a vapor canopy. That vapor canopy prevented seasons from occurring. We had a marine atmosphere, a very thick, miles thick mesosphere that trapped greenhouse gases, ambient radiation. People, animals, and, and flora grew to absolutely astonishing sizes. Zechariah Sitchin had access to all this information. He knew that the, that the oldest calendars of the world did not recognize the year. They were on day count systems. The evening to the morning was a day. Even the book of Genesis in the creation account does not factor in years. They don't care. The, the writers and the scribes were copying from older Babylonian records where it was admitted that time began, the concept of time began, not annually, but annually, it was a day. It was diurnal, meaning the night began the day. The world, the world turned, which was an illusion. It's all a part of our holography. Remember, we're not on a planet spinning. We're not on a ball. I used to believe all that. 
we are in a containment field that's absolutely still until some type of cataclysm protocol is enacted. We're in a contained biosphere, like a Dyson shell. There's no escape from this materially. All escape is done internally. So in the, so in the ancient mindset, we have these 600 year periods, but the year to them was 360 days. It was the degrees of a perfect circle. 360 times that the sky turned. Because remember, these are the earliest calendars of the world did not factor the moon, the sun, didn't care about none of that. The oldest calendars we have on record counted days and they used those day counts as revolutions of the stars. The 600 year period had so impressed the ancients that they had developed many different calendrical systems for them. And you will find the number of days in 600 years to be 216,000 days exactly when you go by the old stellar calendars that they used because they did not incorporate a year of 365.25 because they couldn't. They weren't prophets. They didn't see the future. The 365.25 day did not enter into the historical record until the month of May in the year 713 BC. So in 1687 BC, we have a situation where the civil engineers, the, the, the priesthoods, the government, all those in the know, the elite, they knew they had 48 more years because of a 3,000 year history that showed the significant events that altered their infrastructure always happened at 600 year intervals. And five of these had happened enough to give them the, the confidence in building a calendar that reflected this. And this is all in the Babylonian records as the Anunnaki Nur, the 600 year period, the great year of Flavius Josephus and many other ancient authors. So in 1687 BC, on May 15th, something totally unexpected occurred. The Phoenix weapon was activated. A trumpet sound sounded throughout the entire dome of the sky. Buildings vibrated. People, people fled in terror. Some people, where the resonance was the highest, actually disappeared straight into the ground. Some buildings came, came apart. Others, with some fantastic geopolymer, geopolymer uh, jointing, stayed intact. And we find those at Til, at uh, Til Tuwakan, Til Wanaco, at Cusco, at Puma Punca, and many other ancient sites. So in 1687 BC, totally unexpected, 3,000 years of expectation vanished. They were caught totally unaware. None of these civilizations ever finished their building projects, and we find these projects all over the world. Machu Picchu, 14,000 uh, feet above sea level. How is it there? It's because the Bolivian mountains were thrust right into the air. The Mediterranean Sea had recently been created. Now it's in chaos. Malta is again destroyed. We have the evidence of that destruction worldwide. In my book, When the Sun Darkens, I list many of these cities and civilizations that all met their end. W.J. Perry wrote a 550 page book about the collapse of the Bronze Age civilization. All the dynasties at the time called themselves children of the sun. W.J. Perry is a scholar. His, resor his resources are all cited within my research. He himself had absolutely no idea why it happened, but he dated the total collapse of the old Bronze, Bronze Age civilizations. Worldwide, every civilization died in the year 1688 BC. That is profound. W.J. Perry had no access to the Phoenix research because I had not yet been born when he wrote that book. I was born in 1973. So many other authors like Hans Bellamy, who's almost no one's uh, heard of, Hornerberger, um, oh, there's more. You know, Emmanuel Velikovsky, everybody knows his name. Uh, there's so many, there's so many of them that uh, Charles Hapgood, 
these people put together theories not knowing the Phoenix research, and yet they, and yet they hit the date dead on. It defies coincidence. You know, as I say in my other videos, you know, too many coincidences exhibits no coincidence at all. It's the exact situation with the with this Phoenix Cataclysm in 1687 BC in the month of May. 1687 is the date on the Chinese. No, hey, you have to forgive me here. Please don't be offended. Mawang Handi uh, tablets. I don't really know if I said that right. The bamboo books. Uh, they all date this this terrible cataclysm that occurred and altered the mandate of heaven. It was 1687 BC. Um, Stephen Jones dated the great sun darkening and rocks falling from the sky and all kinds of cataclysm, uh, earthquake that destroyed cities in Canaan. All this happened 1687 BC. His chronology is very precise. So we have here an interruption of an expected calendar. To me, this is evidence just like the meteorite that disrupted the army of Mithridates about to defeat the Romans. And then 10 years later, the tornado that appeared between Mithridates' army and the Romans. Again, we have outside seemingly natural occurrences that completely stop major events from occurring. And we have this over and over again. Twice the Mongols attempted to invade Japan. Twice in a 10 year period, their entire fleet left and they were wiped out by typhoons. Had they have landed, Japan would have been Mongolian. There are so many natural events in, in the history of our world that have been recorded and been recorded as events on natural, but they weren't. They were interruptions something wanted to maintain the holographic status quo or they wanted to cause a change in the holography. I was inspired to do this video because somebody had asked me a question about what about after Phoenix? What can we expect? One of my subscribers sent me a, a series of emails that were very, very, very interesting, but I already had the answer for it. I didn't know because sometimes I have to be triggered in the preface to the Nostradamus book, which adds much more on the Phoenix phenomenon. I painted a very gruesome picture of what we can expect in June of 2040, a month later. A lot of people have not liked reading those two pages. In those two pages, I, paint, I painted an elaborate picture showing that the fracturing of, of our infrastructure is going to cause gangland dictatorships to arise. Neighborhoods will fight neighborhoods for resources. Stores will quickly empty out of all perishables. Roving, roving bands of, of people will become marauders, land pirates. People, people who are preppers today automatically assume that because they're well armed and they have guns and they got, they've got boxes and boxes of ammunition that they're going to be safe and they're going to be all right. No, you're not. You're not. A knife or a staff with a blade on the end of it, like a spear, is going to be a far better, superior weapon than a, than a, than a rifle or a pistol. I'll give you an example. In the city of Houston, I don't live in Houston, I live far north of Houston, but Houston's a huge metropolis, and believe, believe me, if all supply lines collapse, you think those people are gonna stay in, in first, second, third, fourth, fifth ward? You think they're gonna stay in the inner city? You think those people in the suburbs are gonna stay there knowing that 250,000 people are gonna be kicking in their doors? If 25 men are going, if a gang of just 25 men are going door to door kicking them in, they don't care about your guns. They don't care about the shotguns, they don't care. Within three days, 90% of the ammunition that is in the greater Houston area is going to be expended. Yes, there's going to be 100,000 people dead, but that's nothing compared to the hundreds of thousands that are still roaming around looking for food and foraging. I come across a series of books. The first five books were in the possession of some guy who told me, hey man, you might want to check this, these books out. I heard you like William Johnstone. Well, William Johnstone, it was something else. He wrote about Kirby. Kirby. Man, I can't remember Kirby's last name. Kirby Jensen. Smoke Jensen. 
Kirby was renamed Smoke. I read every single book in the Preacher series called the First Mountain Man series. Awesome. William Johnstone is an impeccable researcher. He's going to tell you how to live live off the land. You're going to learn about it in the books, what, all the tricks of the trade, the fur industry, trapping, hunting, all that. The Mountain Man books, the original pioneers of America. The Indians and the shamans, man, they were scared of these mountain men. So I'm given these five books, and I traded five books for them. I can't remember what books I came off of, but it, I, I never came off of, of any type of literature unless I was done reading it and data mining. I gave those books away. I got five books called, the series was called Out of the Ashes, and I shelved it for a while. I was not interested in reading a William Johnstone book where the background setting was in the early 19, mid, mid 1980s. So months go by, and I'm running out of stuff to read. I started reading these books by William Johnstone, set in 1982, 1983. The main character is a retired general, one of the young, youngest U.S. military army generals, General Ben Raines. I couldn't put the book down. In the first three chapters, the main character receives an enigmatic, enigmatic phone call saying, Hey man, head, head to the hills. I know you got a house. I know you got a safe house. You need to get to it. Within 72 hours, everything's going to be over. It says, look, we're, we're real sorry, man. But everything that's about to happen was inevitable. He says, they forced our hand. And they hang up. He's like, what the hell's going on? They say, you know, man, all the news stations go down. This series of books brought chills to my spine. Even the hairs on my arms and my, as I'm talking to you doing this video has just gone up because I remember with perfect clarity. When I read really good fiction, I live it. I see it. And that may, that may be by virtue of long time incarceration. I have a high octane imagination and I'm able to put myself, I can suspend my disbelief to the point I'm experiencing what I'm reading. But I'm reading this book. By the, by the third chapter, 90% of the world's nuclear arsenals have been fired off. Russia, in the, in the story, Russia had forced our hand. They had gotten scared and spooked about something because the United States is performing exercises and they had misinterpreted it on the Russian side some of their own orders and stuff and they had sent, they had sent a first volley of ICBMs toward the uh, northern continental United States to go ahead and take out our cornfields and in Nebraska that have a bunch of nukes that were hidden there. We had to instantly launch ours because we can't have ours destroyed and not be able to retaliate because under the Reagan administration, we, we had began a program called MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction. If we're going to get taken out, we're going to make sure the rest of the world gets reset too. So we still have a material advantage. And in that material advantage, the United States had done something very unique. Now, William Johnstone was revealing some very real stuff in his books. He has been commended by the military. He has awards for how realistic his stuff is. Many of the municipal airports that have been built all around the United States that seem to be innocuous, they seem to be ubiquitous, they seem to be just out of the way, underneath, underneath, those old airports under the taxiways are storage depots put there by the U.S. military. Armaments, guns, munitions, foodstuffs, MREs, MREs, cases and cases and cases of tents and iron supplies, wood, wood to build things with. Everything's been put there. There are thousands of these locations all around the United States. It is designed that way because it is known that in the future a time will come when the United States people and the military are going to have to, are going to suffer a reset. But unlike other resets in the past, we will have the necessary infrastructure and building materials all set in place. Yes, some of those places will be destroyed. Others will be perfectly intact. The general population knows very little about these. But the U.S. military has contractors that go in and they build these underground facilities. They're pretty shallow. You can get, civilians can get to them if you know the location. And then when the contractors are done, U.S. military depot uh, caravans show up and they just bury whole entire vehicles just drive right there underground park the via park the vehicles empty the tanks they have fuel fuel depots everything's there octane boosters are ready to be added to old fuel diesel fuels all there most military vehicles use diesel fuel anyway if any of you want to really enjoy a fascinating series of books it ended up being 24 books i know this for a fact because i read all 24 of them. i ordered them from prison 
William Johnstone paints a picture of exactly what the United States is going to be like after a reset, after a Phoenix event. And, and really, paradoxically, the series, the entire 24 book series is called Out of the Ashes. That just shocks me. It just blows my mind because that's what the Phoenix is. The Phoenix symbol is a world that is destroyed and how the survivors come back out of the ashes. It's just awesome. Out of the Ashes paints a picture like I did in my Nostradamus book. Super gnomes turned into ter terror fields where gangland dictatorships watch blood sports. Captured people are forced to fight, fight to the death. They fight against animals, they fight against machines, they fight against each, each other. It's a whole cyberpunk society all over again. It is absolutely fascinating. I paint this picture of Nostradamus in the Plants of Apocalypse, but I would have never been able to, in a million years, put together what William Johnstone did in 24 books, showing how cannibalism, cults, and strange religious orders appeared. Ex-military guys all got together and started, started uh, uh, whole new militaries, race wars developed, people were, were segregated, Chinatowns became places where other races couldn't go, uh, the different types of weapons that were developed, one common denominator was, was the U.S. military had already prepared for all of it, and civilians and under General Ben Rains who came back and started leading two or three hundred survivors together, and they started going to raid all these depots, and they built an army, and, and within four years, General Ben Rains had one of the most powerful armies in the United States vying for territory and just survival in a post-cataclysmic North America where everything had fallen apart. There were no more states, no more governments. Everybody was just fighting and building these building these new survivalist camps and communities. And they were raiding each other. And, and the series of books is fantastic. All the, all the military hardware you will learn about that's usable after a reset. Uh, how they rebuilt the Air Force by going back through all the Army depots and pulling out all the World War II. Anything from World War II was, was being rebuilt easy because that type of engineering is very easy to repair and maintain. Anything with computer circuitry and stuff was, was just thrown away. It was scrapped and used for different stuff. It, it wasn't possible to use that stuff. So it's just fascinating. He's very graphic about what happens to the children, how women are sold for chattel property, how weapons are exchanged for people, slavery. Sla uh, slavery is strong in his books. Uh, the type of fighting styles. It's we William Johnstone's book, Out of the Ashes, is absolutely awesome. I just wanted to tell you guys about that because there is a fiction writer out there. He's dead now, but he did produce a 24-book series. And if any of you want to know what it's going to be like for the first four, four or five months after a Phoenix reset, you need to read these books because he did a much better job than I ever could. The simulacrum is our present existence. It is an editable existence. It's edited by us from within it, immersed in this Maya, this world of illusion that we are jacked into through our central nervous system. But it's also controlled, observed, and edited by, by humans on the outside. We are living in an ancestor simulation. Now, this simulation or series of timelines has gone through multiple edits. From outside the context of the simulation, these are just programming edits because we have figured things out and it's time to move forward. There's no reason to rerun past simulations, so we have a new starting point. But we have to edit it. We have to edit in the new starting point at a certain area. Like if 3,000, the 3,343 years of history have passed, and all the timelines now. Now that we have lived through them all, we see and we've observed, now we see, okay, well, cool. These, this is the series of output that we were looking for. We can survive this because that's what these simulations are all about. It's about human survival on an on oncoming event. The, I call it the nemesis simulation because it's all about the known, the foreknown collapse of a binary star and how it's going to affect both solar systems. How one solar system is going to die and how we can get those worlds away from the dying star to the to the star that still remains without creating all kinds of solar system wide cataclysms. So the Phoenix phenomenon is initiated by something that is hidden in the sky. The starry canopy is not real. What you when you go outside your backyard and you look up at 
2 o'clock in the morning at that beautiful array of luminaries in the sky. You are looking into a multi-tiered hologram from the inside of like a toroid shell, a Dyson shell that's in the shape of a toroid. And you can stay, you can thank Stephen Walsworth for putting me on that one. I have been really looking into the tor toroid uh, geometry and it does explain the, the, our, our anomalous situation. But the Phoenix Phenomenon is a weapon hidden in the sky. It's activated every 138 years, but it does not mean that it affects everywhere every 138 years. It acts with discretion. When it activates, somewhere on this world is going to suffer mud floods, volcanic resurfacing. They're gonna suffer liquefaction. A horn blast from the sky is so loud and deafening that solid objects liquefy from vibration. People, Biology, you know, we're made, we're made of biological shells. Well, it's very hard to bring something that is made of almost all liquids to, to bring it into resonance with a solid. If a horn blast from the sky is deafening and it's hitting a certain decibel level, then glass is the first, crystal and glass is the first, and then all stone and then metal. It will vibrate at the same frequency. It will all, it will all, being in a resonance when it does everything loses its physical properties the vibrations become so intense the ground the bedrock the foundations of buildings buildings pyramids pyramidal structures ancient city ancient cities uh, wagons wagons wheelbarrows whatever's on the ground it just sinks it just goes straight in the ground the problem is is the humans humans oh uh, it takes a while for them to build up in resonance. It can vibrate a human completely out of existence. We're made of liquids. Animal. Animals and humans, we're made of liquid. This is the reason why humans are able to get away. Humans to cover their ears and run and get out get out of get out of the region. Or go into a body of water where the resonance won't 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 be applied. It'll actually be dissonance. So while everything is sinking, like Go Blakey Teepee, like uh, Mohenjo Daro, like many, many ancient Sumerian cities where we found whole libraries buried intact at Nippur and Ur and Uruk, Uruk and Nineveh, this liquefaction, this liquefaction sinks the constructions of men, but the people themselves escape or they just vanish. I'm not really sure. Because we have found many underground underground cities and places, and archaeologists even theorize, absolute bullshit, they even theorize that places like Goblek TV, because it was completely buried in mud that turned to dirt and solidified, was actually done by the people themselves before they left, which is a ridiculous notion. To have buried Goblek TV in dirt would have required more labor and more man hours of, of work than building Goblek TV itself. Cattle, cattle Hoyuk as well. Same, same theory. It's stupid. It's stupid. The Phoenix phenomenon every 138 years acts with discretion, meaning, meaning we are being observed. When we hit a certain technological capacity, or when we hit a certain area of enlightenment in the collective, not in the individual, but in the collective, the Phoenix phenomenon activates as a reset protocol. It's devastating. It, it also it also operates at orders of magnitude because in 3895 BC, in 1239 BC, and in 1687 BC, those three dates, easily known in, the, in recorded history, verified by many ways, mentioned by many chronographers in the ancient past and in modern times, backed up by scientific analysis in geology and archaeology, not making anything up, every bit of it can be verified. I've got whole books published about these three dates about the Phoenix phenomenon. Those three dates were pole shifts. They were devastating. Truly horrific what happened. Don't have any evidence of liquefaction on those dates, but the liquefaction events seem to be highly localized only in certain areas. They are not hemispheric. Every time the Phoenix phenomenon occurs, humans see it coming first. The first thing that's noticed is that 
all the red stars in the skies, which are, astronomers call them variable stars. Variable stars are not like other luminaries. Variable stars are called variable stars because they change their magnitudes, which is very unusual meaning sometimes they're very, very dim and sometimes they're very, very bright. In my Dark Realities video, I explained that these luminaries aren't true stars. These are local objects that are very close to our atmosphere. The Phoenix Phenomenon is created by a holographic projector system. This, I, what, I, what I am describing is something that is technologically advanced. It's inside the simulacrum. Or it's outside the simulacrum, but it's but it creates phenomena optically and physically that's inside the snow. Right before Phoenix happens, every time in the month of May, every 138 years, all the variable stars, they start tripping. They start getting bright and dim, bright and dim, they start flashing, and then all of a sudden, a fiery red dragon form appears in, the, in space, in the heavens, as seen from the surface of our world. Sometimes it devours the sun, sometimes it devours the moon, sometimes it, sometimes it darkens the sun and it turns the moon red. But every time, right here, right here in our world, we suffer red rains, red mud, red fallout, red ash, all kinds of stuff falls. And like, since 1890, when we've been recording meteorological events, it's been reported by the media that it's always dust from the Sahara. My friends, the Sahara has white sand. Red dust is not gonna come from deserts that are covered in white sand. These dusts are coming from the skies. They are not coming from anywhere on, on this world. Just like frozen tadpoles, frozen insects, fish, they come from the sky. They don't come from anywhere else on this world. There aren't enough typhoons and tornadoes and cyclones to suck up all the fish from the sea that have been rained on different countries. Yes, yes, my friends. Another aspect of the Phoenix phenomenon are strange things falling out of the sky. So, every 138 years, this, this phenomenon, this, this engine apparatus hidden in the sky can activate. And it's amazing that in 5,700 years of recorded history, for which we have dates, and I have recorded in my Chronicon, we have 23 or 24 different 138 year periods. And there's only 46 in that time period. That's phenomenal. The reason it's phenomenal is because thousands of libraries have been destroyed. Thousands, thousands of book burnings and purges. Christians blame the Muslims and the and Muslims blame the Byzantines, the Eastern Orthodox Christians, and the Romans blame the Carthaginians, and the Carthaginians blame the Romans. Phoenicians had vast libraries. They blame they blame the Italians and the Greeks for stealing them, for stealing their copies. Uh, Library of Pergamum, it was sold sold to uh, Carthage. Romans ended up getting that. They burned a bunch of those. Christian, Christian book, bur book burnings went on for over a thousand years. And that was absolutely necessary. It was necessary because when the Christian chronographers like Justin and Augustine rewrote uh, all the histories for Constantine, and added in all these pseudo histories that didn't even exist concerning Jesus, and they added in all these miracles and all the all these apostle deals that never were in the original text. They had to rewrite all these uh, all, all these other books in order to in order to lend it credence. Unfortunately, we have busted them. Scholars now know which areas of the books of Josephus and Philo Judaicus and, and other ancient texts, ta, ta, uh, Tatian, Tacitus, uh, Julia, uh, Julian. Who, where all the forged texts are, we know this now, and it's easy to it's easy to discern because what the early early Catholics Roman Church didn't didn't take into consideration was that a thousand years later archaeologists would begin opening the tombs and catacombs of many people in Rome and surrounding areas in Italy, uh, Vesuvius and Pompeii and Herculaneum, and you know we have a bunch of copies of those books. Books have been discovered, even new books by Livy. All, it's all been discovered, and we see what the original copies convey. 
When it comes to the Phoenix Phenomenon, we're talking about a weapon in the sky that is hidden that was specifically designed to retard human development, slow humans down because we are fascinating and absolutely industrious creatures. And if you think that this is the first time we've been technologically advanced, you only think that because you are uneducated and have no knowledge whatsoever of the thousands of archaeological artifacts that have been found and revealed to the world through different venues. In a nutshell, it's a weapon hidden in the sky. It can activate every 138 years, but we don't have we don't have records that it did activate every 100, but it skipped one or two times every once in a while. Then we have a stretch in the Bronze Age to, to the days of Rome where it didn't miss a beat. It appeared like nine times in a row. The single most chaotic time in, in world history was from about 19, uh, 1963 B.C., all the way to 721 BC. We had, like, we had 10 or 11 Phoenix, Phoenix appeared all back to back, didn't miss a beat. We have the records for each one, every 138 years like clockwork. It was appearing like clockwork so much that we even have four different times at that period of history where it was predicted. And, and even militaries used it to their advantage to scare the enemy. Pretended to be spellcasters. When the, when, the, when the moon turned red and the sun darkened, rocks fell out the sky, massive earthquakes, ge geologic upheavals. So, but the Phoenix phenomenon is a cataclysm protocol. It's not a real planet. It's not an intruder planet. It's not leaving the solar system and coming back because everything you see in the sky is a simulated solar system. So it doesn't leave and come back. It actually it's, it just—it really doesn't exist until those variable stars start tripping and they start all blinking and, and changing their magnitudes. And because I believe those are nodal apertures, projectors—they are simulacrum projectors that create phenomena, just like intense storms are phenomena that are created. Listen to listen. You guys have common sense. If our science is so sophisticated that we've been to the moon and we've sent probes outside the solar system, if our science is so sophisticated that we have performed uh, splitting atoms and, and the discovery of positrons and neutrinos and all this BS that we're told, if our science is so sophisticated that we have done all of this exploration on our world, how is it? that weathermen can't 100% accurately predict the weather. If you have weather stations set up every five miles, then you already know what the weather is in real time. Follow me? Weathermen aren't predicting anything. They know where, what the weather is in real time, everywhere. And if the winds are, he are headed, you know, 15, 15 mile an hour winds with 20 mile an hour gusts at, at south by southeast, then they automatically know the path of the storm, so their prediction is merely a trajectory inferred by geometry. It's ain't actual predictions. All you're doing is giving us projections based off past telemetry. Very easy to do. That's what weathermen do. But every time they're wrong, what do weathermen tell you? Oh. It ended up being a beautiful day today. We're so proud. Of, well, we're so we're so glad to live right here in Corpus Christi, Texas. Beautiful, beautiful weather and all that. Oh, uh, we had a high pressure system coming. Yeah, I'm, I'm tired of hearing about your low pressure systems and your high pressure systems that completely, <coughs> completely, they're completely used as explanations as to why the weather didn't go the way the weatherman said it was going to go. My point in telling you all this is about. The weather, the weather isn't caused by a ball spinning around on an axis. The weather isn't caused by that at all. There are no 1,000 mile an hour winds up there in the atmosphere. The weather isn't caused by the Newtonian physics that we're led to believe. It's caused by something else. It's called, the simulacrum has its own protocols. It's not easy to anticipate it. Freak weather systems have happened all the time. 
after years of, of conducting this research and looking at different avenues, I find it I find it referenced in many other places. Not the Phoenix phenomenon, but the event itself. The prophecies of Mother Shipton, I find the Phoenix. And the exact date for its return in 2040. In the prophecies of Nostradamus, again, we have the date index of Mario Reading, where he isolates some very, very Phoenix-related catastrophic events for the year 2040. David Davidson's research on the Great Pyramid isolates the year 2040 several times in his measurements. Other evidence about the 138 year holography is interesting because it comes in the form of the ancient lunar calendar. The Egyptians were really big on dating things by, by months, not years. And there is a there is an Egyptian text that refers to a flooding happening at the end of a 1656 month period. That's really interesting because 1656 months is 138 years. In Central America is a pyramid complex built by the Toltecs. The dimensions of those pyramids, the dimensions of those pyramids relate to the number 138. The height and the distance between both pyramids, both of them are commensurate with 138's value, the value of 138. But pyramids being associated with 138 is not novel because the Great Pyramid in Egypt, the only pyramid in the entire world that has an ascendant passage, that has a grand gallery, that has a king's chamber, and has an antechamber going into the king's chamber. No other pyramids in the world have these features because no other pyramids in the world were built when, the, when these features were known. The upper, the upper portions of the Great Pyramid in Egypt were sealed off for thousands of years. During the entire history of the pharaohs, no pharaohs knew that the king's chamber was there. It was unknown. It was sealed. It wasn't until the year 820 Common Era, about 12 centuries ago, that Al Mamon and his expedition, the Caliph of Baghdad in modern-day Iraq, back then it was Babylon, he tunneled into the Great Pyramid and found a passage leading up. First human in recorded history who 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 went up there and they found absolutely nothing. They were shocked. They were thinking there would be all kinds of treasures in those chambers and all that. But the treasures, they're there. But they're in rectilinear geometrical proportions. I use those measurements and by using those measurements, I compare them with the events of world history. Pretty much, I can pretty much map out the entire history of the world using the Great Pyramid. It's not even a mystery to me no more. The Phoenix phenomenon is a discretionary is a discretionary phenomenon. It, it picks and chooses, or its controllers pick and choose what it's going to affect. Man, that's that's unusual. But the discretion goes even deeper because I have provided evidence in some of my videos and posts in archaics that uh, the Phoenix Phenomenon may be a benefactor weapon. A benefactor created the Phoenix Phenomenon or hijacked it in order to target the elite. I just have to say, more and more I'm seeing evidence that the Phoenix Phenomenon takes out elitist cities, elitist facilities. It knocks them back down. Because the elite, for some reason, have always been controlled. There has never been a time in world history where the where the, the ruling families were not ruling. They just changed their identities, and they also changed their time times. You have to understand the whole theory of the thirteen families. It may be true. It may not be. I don't know. But what I have seen in my research is that there are different arms of this state, of this of this deep state, of this of this ruling a hierarchy over humanity. There are different arms and they, they're just like the Rosicrucians who disappear and they quit proselytizing for 108 years. And then for 108 years, they're very active getting members, membership, doing all, they're, all, they're all doing charities and all that stuff. Same thing with the elite. When the world has tired or grown fed up with a certain echelon of the elite, 
they're removed by another echelon of the elite or who are regarded as the good guys. But these are not good guys. They're just another arm of the same hydra. It's the same old game over and over. And because they have this structure of ruling the world no matter no matter uh, what kings get dethroned and all that, that means the common people are always going to be subjugated. The Phoenix phenomenon seems to be retarding their development, their ability. Because if they were to have their way every single time, what is the common denominator between, between uh, dictators throughout history? It is the creation of an empire. What do empires do? They seek to control all, all of the world they can. So basically, em, empirism is globalism. Or, if you don't like the globe model, you know, I, I'm, not glo I'm not a globe or a flat earther. And I'm not just trying to stay neutral either. I'm a simulationist. And simulation theory encompasses both. All the facts and evidences that are provided in flat earth are answered in simulation theory. All the proofs and evidences that we live on, 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 a, on a planet going around the sun are answered and explained in simulation theory. Because we're not. I promise you that. Everything is simulated to make you believe that it is. But it's not. I'm telling you. I, say, I tell you guys all the time. Not only is our world not what you think, but the stars lie. What's going to occur is lithospheric displacement. It hasn't happened since 39, 3895 BC. I'm not just throwing that date out there, guys. I know some of you newcomers, you're just not there yet. You're not, you're not able to even process most of this information because you haven't seen the data. But the data sets are there for you to see. So if you can hang in there, you're gonna learn on my channel things that you have never, never would have learned anywhere else. That does not mean other people cannot provide value at all. What it means is that you have, an, you have an archive of data for which the world would have never known about had I not put it together. And it would have never been put together had not the big man upstairs, whoever he is, God or goddess, had not put me in prison to do this. And not only just put me in prison, but instilled within me that, that, that innate drive to discover, to want to know history, to learn. We're not free. We're not free at all. We're, f we're given choices, which is the illusion of freedom. We're not free at all. Something induced me to do this. So I'm doing it. 